to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're very happy to welcome you and to uh, that you're bringing us into your home on your computer or if you're carrying your iPad, however you're listening to us. We'd love to have you worship with us in person. If you're ever in our area, come here and we'll make you feel welcome. We want to know that we ask God's blessings upon you. We ask for you to bring Jesus into your heart. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. This is a Bible-based church. We're very happy to have you come worship with us. We repent, believe, love God, love your neighbor. We love our neighbors as ourselves. We, our ministry, we feel called from God. And we minister to the people in our community. We serve 8,000 meals a month. Some are hot meals, some are meals that we give to the people to take out that do not have food. As we are so blessed that God has given us food to share with others. We love God, we love our neighbor. We ask you to come worship with us. We love you, we miss you, we welcome you. We need you to come here and worship with us. We also want you to take Jesus Christ, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. We want us all to be in heaven together in eternity. And we want to have our lives filled with Jesus Christ as we love God, love our neighbors, and we're happy, we're favored of God, we're children of God. This is the 4th of January. We're celebrating Epiphany. Epiphany is the light that came into the world, the star that showed the wise men the way, the Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. We're celebrating the Nativity, and now we're celebrating the Epiphany. Twelve days of Christmas will then be over, and we'll start to study Jesus' life as an adult. Next Sunday, we'll meditate on the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come and receive His personal presence as he has died for us and he will give himself to us today we thank you Lord for that good morning and happy new year to everyone good to be back I hope you had a restful and happy new year on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, one announcement concerning our worship this morning. As we come to the end of the service, you will see after the post-communion prayer, it says a hymn. It says, For the Father's love to God. Admit that. Ignore that. That's a holdover from Christmas Eve, where we sang Silent Night there when we were uh, That was a hymn sung at the 8 o'clock service uh, in place of the choir anthem. So, you will be singing 303 at the beginning and 510 at the end or 295. So let us now turn to page two in our worship bulletin. And I invite those who came without difficulty to please. Also, as on Christmas Eve, I will be using a different word of absolution than what's printed in the bulletin. Uh, the ones that are on page 96, the alternative. Just haven't been able to get replaced in the bulletin as of yet. We gather together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not left you with our whole heart. We have not left our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We now begin our celebration with brightest and best of the stars of the morning, hymn number 303, in the back of your worship. Hymn number 303. This is the second Sunday of Christmas, January the 4th, 2014. This hymn was written by Bland Tucker in the 1800s, but the music is from the 1400s. This is the second Sunday of Christmas. We're emphasizing Epiphany, the star, the three wise men, the 12 days of Christmas. This is uh, the second Sunday of Christmas. We meditate upon the light that's come into the world, our Epiphany, that's shown us that Jesus is our Savior.
Let us pray. Almighty oh, God, you have filled all the earth with the light of your incarnate word. By your grace, empower us to reflect your light in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the reading of God. Connie Singleton will read God's word to us today. Good morning. The first reading is from Jeremiah, 31st chapter, 17 verses. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away, saying, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd of the flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men in the old shall be married. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my body, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pleasure. 
that is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we were the first to set out our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. read by Pastor Pollock. by the choir directed by Vicki Perks. This is the second Sunday of Christmas. For the last time we'll have our Christmas decorations because the Epiphany is uh, the 12th day of Christmas and that's going to be upon us very soon. Listen to our choir, second Sunday of Christmas, directed by Vicki Perks.
is an indispensable part of life. Without hope, we find ourselves becoming like some do who have no hope, being enslaved to drugs, or enslaved to alcohol, enslaved to a hedonistic lifestyle, enslaved to the old idea that we drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But there is hope. And we as followers of Jesus Christ have that hope. That is why it is important that we share it with the rest of the world. That we, as St. Jude says in his letter, that we contend for the faith. That is, that we constantly champion faith in Jesus Christ. There is hope in the world and the proof is in our gospel lesson for today. Today we gather together for the second Sunday of Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas are almost over. On Tuesday we celebrate the Feast of Epiphany, and that brings the Christmas celebration to an end. In our Christmas celebration, on Christmas Eve we read that ever familiar, ever popular, account of Christ's birth in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. On Epiphany, you read St. Matthew's account of Jesus' birth, which does not include the shepherds, and does not talk about the manger and being laid in the manger, but seems to begin with after Mary and Joseph come to Bethlehem just to some weeks later, or even maybe a year or two later, when these strangers from the east come to worship him who has been born and king of the Jews. As you are aware, St. Mark has no account of Jesus' birth, but immediately begins with Jesus as an adult. But today's gospel lesson, this first chapter of the gospel according to St. John, St. John once again brings us the Christmas story. Not historically, chronologically, blow by blow, word for word, play by play, of the first Christmas, but he gives us the theological explanation of Christmas. And it is in this theological explanation that we discover the hope that carries us through each and every day. The hope that is with us even when days are dark, even when we face disappointment, even when we face trial and tribulation, we have hope because of what St. John tells us in this first chapter. What St. John is describing is the Incarnation. It is summed up in the 14th verse of our Gospel lesson for the day. And the Word became flesh. The word Incarnation means God becoming flesh, God taking on human form. And so this is what sometimes with all the sentimentality around Christmas and, and all the false bragging about Christmas of, oh, if I'd been there, I would have found room for the Mary and Joseph. I would have let them in my house. I'd have given them my bed so Mary could deliver in safety and so forth. We say that because we're looking from hindsight. If we were there, we'd have been like everybody else. But John now tells us why all that was important. It's because the Word became flesh. God took on human form and came among us. Let us look in verse 14 more seriously. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father, only Son, full of grace and truth. In that one verse, we have almost the entire gospel spoken, illustrated, explained. Now, I know it's common, and Luther supposedly is credited with having said at first that it's common to say John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But in this 14th verse we also have the gospel in a nutshell. And the word became, that word became means to enter into a new condition it means a completed action. So the Word became a 
or is formed in the flesh. The word flesh means the whole person, the entire person. Jesus was truly human, and he was truly divine. Both divine and human in that one person. Because the word became flesh and lived among us. That word live means to set up a tent among. It means to reside with. It means to occupy the same area. It means to encamp with. This Greek word actually is used all the times when talking about the Old Testament experience of the Hebrew children wandering in the wilderness and how when they would come to an encampment, they would set up the tabernacle. And God would dwell with them in that tabernacle. And we read in Exodus and Deuteronomy how Moses would go into the tabernacle and beseech God on behalf of the Hebrew children and he would come out and his face would be radiant and would be glowing. And that tabernacle was the idea of God among them. So here St. John is using that same imagery. Jesus set himself up among us. He pitched his tent where we have our tent. He encamped where we encamped. He resides where we reside. He occupied the same earth that we occupy. And we have seen his glory. This means the word seen, actual physical sight. Jesus was not some religious vision. He was not a, some dream of a seer. People actually saw him, physical sight, saw the living, breathing Jesus Christ walking among the earth. When St. John writes the book of Revelation, he talks about how it was the Lord's day and he went into a vision, came to him. He talks about Revelation as a vision. But when he talks about Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry and his coming to earth, it's no vision. It was something that was a reality that was seen. And we have seen his glory, the glory of a Father, only Son, full of grace and truth. Now I would encourage everybody, if you have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, to take your insert and underline full of grace and truth. Because this is why I say this is the gospel in a nutshell, just like John 3.16. The word full means, the Greek word literally means to be abundant, or complete. The word grace means acceptance or kindness granted. So what St. John is telling us here is that Jesus, the Word made flesh, came among us uh, with abundant acceptance for all people, with complete acceptance for all people, with abundant kindness granted, and with complete kindness granted. That is what makes Christianity, or one of the things that makes Christianity different than religion. Faith in he who came, who accepts all people, no matter their faults, no matter their foibles, no matter their blemishes, no matter their mistakes, no matter how messed up they are. When you believe in Jesus, he accepts you fully and completely. He gives you that abundant kindness that kindness of everlasting life. So what does this all mean? What does this have to do with hope? Because I started out talking about hope. That is everything. Because from the incarnation, from the Word becoming flesh, because of Jesus coming and living among us, tending among us, occupying, residing among us, full of, abundantly, completely full of this grace and kindness and acceptance. Because of all this, first of all, we know we have salvation. Now since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, civilizations have tried to figure out how to appease a supreme being. I do not know of a civilization in history that did not believe in some kind of supreme being of some kind or another. They might have been wrong, but they still believe they might have believed it was a volcano, it was a moon, it was a sun. There's some tribe out in the Pacific somewhere, I remember years ago watching a special on them, suffering and they believe that sharks are God of the sharks and they worship sharks. And they have this crazy thing where they'll go out and jump in the water among sharks. Well, somehow that's worshiping God. And people thought God's youth were similar to cows and bulls or bull with a human head, all kinds of crazy things. 
But people have always realized that there was a supreme being and somehow you had to make that supreme being happen. And if you did wrong, there was obviously some kind of penalty that you had to pay in order to have an afterlife. And so the religions of the world sprung up. And God appointed the Hebrew children to be a light unto the nation so that they would know who God really was. Or what God was really like. But the Hebrew children didn't always do what they were supposed to do. And so all the time they found themselves being conquered and being in exile and being oppressed by some other foreign ruler. So they came more inward instead of outward, not really sharing that light. God wanted them to share. So he sent his son. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And this assures us that we have salvation. It addresses that need for salvation and also reminds us that because of sin, we cannot earn our own salvation. But that this is something God brings to us through faith. That God out of that great love for us, that care for us, that in order to solve the problem of separation between him and us due to sin, he sends his one and only son. So that the one and only son takes all the sin upon the world upon himself when he's nailed to that cross that first good Friday. And his blood pays that debt of sin that we owe. And his resurrection ascension and assures us not only of salvation, but also that we have that gift of everlasting life. And so the word became flesh. But it didn't stop there. Just being born into the world, just the Word becoming flesh wasn't enough. As I said, it took the death of the Word made flesh to pay the penalty of sin. And so the Word grew into an adult. And for three years wandered around revealing God through His preaching and His miracles and His actions. And then paid that ultimate price, giving His life on behalf of us. So the incarnation tells us that we have salvation, not by anything we do. That we don't have to abide by a bunch of rules and regulations like the religions of the world, but instead it's God's free gift. God's gift of acceptance. God's gift of kindness granted. All through His Son, faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. So we have hope because we know we have salvation. And we know that nothing can take that salvation away from us. As St. Paul said in that famous 8th chapter of Romans, verses 38 and 39, I'm convinced that neither death nor light nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come to height nor death nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the incarnation, the Word made flesh, gives us hope in, first of all, the fact that we have salvation. Second, the incarnation tells us we have hope because we have affirmation. <clears throat> the incarnation is the supreme affirmation of the value of human existence. There are some today who try to tell us that as human beings we are no better than animals or plants. That as human beings we have no right to do what we do because we're all evil. But that's not what Holy Scripture tells us. Holy Scripture tells us that God made us the crown of creation and placed us on earth to take care of the earth, to love it, to care for it, to nurture it so that we could pass it on to our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. And so we are to be careful with the earth. But still, we are the crown of creation. Animals and plants are not our equal, and that's what the Incarnation shows us. It affirms that to God, we are the most important. To God, we are very important. There are those who would try to argue with you about the supremacy of animals. I can remember living on my grandma's farm watching the news one night. I can't remember if it was Huntley Brinkley or if it was Water Crocodile. It was one or the other. But it was a story about some fellow who was going to Washington, D.C. to see the First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, to try to get her support for this new uh, movement he was trying to start, which was entitled Clothe the Naked Animals. And on the broadcast, he had a little jingle he sang about Clothe the Naked Animals. Oh, they don't have to be naked. Oh, my parents sitting there watching this. At this time, we still had cattle and horses on the farm. We haven't switched it yet 
to an all grain farm just raising corn and soybeans. So my grandma's wife, and she just broke out like, she goes, does that fellow really want to change the pants of a horse or a cow after they've done their business in them? <laughs> Said, see how long he talks about clothing they can have. Animals don't need clothes, they're animals. And the incarnation affirms that we are what is most important to God. That we are his children. That human existence is so important that he sent his own son to become like a human and divine upon earth. To live through that humanity to experience what we experience. To experience weakness. Being tempted as we are tempted. To experience suffering as we experience suffering. One of the gospels that didn't make it into the New Testament has an account of the death of Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. And it talks about Jesus being at the grave of Joseph and crying. Just like we read in the Gospel of John about when Jesus finds out Lazarus is dead, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So Jesus suffered as we suffered. He knew what it was to lose someone he loved through death. And of course, he suffered in death far worse, hopefully, than we'll ever suffer. Well, no matter what, how we die, cannot be as bad as crucifixion, one of the most horrible ways of death ever invented by the man. That was all God saying to us, affirming to us how important we are to him. The great Russian writer Tolstoy was walking down the street one day and a beggar approached him and asked him for some alms, for some money. Tolstoy began to reach in his vest pockets and in his coat pockets and in his trouser pockets, fears of trying to find some kind of coin or some bit of money. But he came up empty and he had nothing. And so he said to the beggar, he said to him, quote, please don't be angry with me, my brother, but I have nothing with me. If I did, I would have gladly given it to you, the quote. Immediately the beggar's face began to radiate shine and he looked up at Tolstoy and he said, oh sir, quote, sir, you have given me more than I asked for. You have called me brother. Through Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, Jesus calls us brother and sister. Through the word made flesh, God affirms that we are children of the Heavenly Father, heirs to all that Jesus Christ won for us through his suffering and death alone. Through the Word made flesh, the Incarnation, God affirms that not only can we call each other brother and sister in Christ, but that we can look upon Jesus as our big brother. And so that gives us hope. And the third thing, quickly, that the Incarnation tells us is that we have identification. The Incarnation demonstrates that God identifies with us in our human life and that he is sympathetic to what we go through. There is no parallel in any of the religions of the world to the sympathetic presence of God in Jesus Christ. Buddha doesn't have that sympathy. Muhammad doesn't. The gods of the Hindus don't. Confucius doesn't. Sun Yat Moon doesn't. Scientology doesn't. Only in the Word made flesh. We see God sympathetic to the human struggle. For the great mass of humanity, life is difficult. We all know that. We all go through life, and none of us have had an easy life. Even if we are fortunate enough to be born into a family of substance, we still have difficulty. And it is God through Jesus Christ that identifies so much with those difficulties, so much with those burdens, that in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says to us, Come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Give us rest in him through what he has done, the word becoming flesh, identifying with us completely. The story is told that Queen Victoria would like to would enjoy leaving the castle of Buckingham Palace in London and go to an estate out in the country. 
And when she would go out to this estate, she would oftentimes disguise herself and slip out of the estate and go down into the village. And she would mingle among the villagers and listen to their conversations and what they were saying and so forth. So one day she slipped out of the estate with her trusted servant, John Brandt. And he watched as she walked on ahead of him somewhat so no one would recognize her. And as she was walking, she came upon a flock of sheep being driven by a young boy who shouted out to her, Keep out of the way, you stupid old woman. The queen just smiled and kept on walking. Well, by then, the servant caught up with the young boy and he said, Do you realize you just called stupid old woman? And he said, No, a stupid old woman. And he goes, No, that's Queen Victoria. And the boy responded, Huh? Well, then she ought to dress like a queen. People look at Jesus, and because he's not what they meant, they fail to identify him. They fail to identify with him because they wanted Jesus that will fulfill all their prejudices, all their wants, all their greed, all their desires of the flesh. Not a Jesus who comes in humility, who told us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Who told us that the true meaning of life is not the trinkets we collect, but our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. So just like that boy couldn't identify the queen because she was in disguise, some people fail to see God in the disguise of Jesus Christ. And when they fail to accept Jesus, then they have no hope. But because we know that Jesus identifies with us, because we know that God came to us through Jesus, we have that hope. Do you have no hope? Do you feel like throwing in the tap? If you do, then turn to Jesus. Turn to the Word made flesh. Turn to the incarnation, that first Christmas. Because in that incarnation, we have the assurance of salvation, the assurance of affirmation, and the assurance of identification. Being, having salvation, having that affirmation, having that identity with Christ, we then have hope that never can be taken from us. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding in your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
Our response today is hear our prayer. Let us pray that in this new year, all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus will resolve to testify to his life with renewed zeal. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray that in this new year, nations shall not rise up against the nation, and that mutual understanding and the spirit of righteousness will prevail over all peoples of the earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray that in this new year, God's healing and comforting spirit will be known among all the children of the earth, so that they may rejoice once again in healing and wholeness. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all students and young people, that they may be supported by their families and faith communities as they learn and grow. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for grace to entrust our faithful departed to God's never-failing care, which sustained them in their pilgrimage on earth, and which continues to hold them in communion with us, and with all the saints in life. God of grace, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Hear our prayers, gracious God, and may us always in the light of your word make flesh. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Now time for our offering as pastor is preparing the elements of Holy Communion will receive the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. Connie Singleton, Helen Wallace are our ushers. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We meditated today that Jesus is full of grace. He's full of grace with us. He's filled the earth with the light of his presence. By his grace, he empowers us to reflect the light from him in all that we do through Jesus Christ. We know that our brothers and sisters, the children of God, with us are watching this broadcast. We ask that you will come and worship with us and help us to serve God and to love one another. We here at St. John's Lutheran Church offer a ministry to those in the surrounding area. We also offer these worship services in which we can worship our God, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We may receive Christ, we may adore him, we may adore the newborn king, which we have just finished doing through the celebration of Christmas holidays. We now see Becky Dimitrov, who is assisting the pastor today in the communion service. We invite you to virtually receive Holy Communion today. We have made our profession of faith in the Nicene Creed. We've confessed our sins. We love God, we love one another. We invite you, our brothers and sisters, children of God. We miss you, we love you. We want you to come worship with us anytime, eight o'clock on Sunday mornings, 10.30 on Sunday mornings, and 6.30 an informal service in the chapel. Come worship, come adore the newborn king, come serve God. We'll be all be together in the world that is to come, the new world, the new heaven, the new earth. We'll all be together and also the kingdom on earth today Accept Jesus, ask him to be, to come into your heart, to make him Lord of your life.
vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. This is the holy, holy, holy with the song twos. We believe that all who have gone before us are here worshiping with us. All the saints, all the angels are around the altar.
Lutheran Church are receiving Holy Communion. Our pastor is Pastor John Pollock, and Becky Dimitrov is the communion assistant. We're thankful for your watching us today on YouTube. We pray that you'll, if you are able, if you're in our area, to come worship with us, to accept Jesus into your heart, make him your personal savior, come with us, worship with us, and receive him in Holy Communion. Worship with us and all those who have gone before us. You see the pastor is receiving the blood, the body, the blood of Jesus Christ. He fills us with his spirit and allows us to serve him. He is full of grace and truth, and we can be full of his grace and truth as we receive him. Thank you for watching St. John's on YouTube. We'd like for you to come worship with us in person. Join us as brothers and sisters, the children of God. Join us every time you can watch YouTube. We're on.
Information, call the school office 325 4311. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. I'm your announcer, uh, Dr. Sally Abbott, and the videographer is Linda Fox. We hope and we pray that God continues to bless you and keep you all of these days. We'll pray for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God. We ask that you make Jesus your personal Savior, make him Lord of your life. Come here and worship with us. Continue to pray for us, watch us on YouTube, pray for our ministry. God bless you.